A soldering special, part two, using more powerful, higher wattage soldering irons of different types for those larger jobs. Before I commence this episode, I would like to say something. I really am getting a bit fed up of people sending comments in, which wouldn't have been required had they have watched the video all the way to the end. But such is life, it's something you have to put up with if you make YouTube videos. Or the other thing that people do is comment on the first episode of a series. Almost immediately after I put this one on Patreon, I received a comment from a viewer telling me about the problems with different types of fluxes. Well, to be honest, I do actually know this. And later on in this episode, I will mention the type of solder and flux to use. If you look at the title on episode 1 and the title on episode 2, you may notice that these first two episodes are all about types of soldering irons. So try and contain your excitement and don't write in before the series even gets going. In the last episode, I showed Antex soldering irons. Here's one of them, I have two more. A while ago, at a local large DIY store, I bought this soldering iron. This is a 40 watt soldering iron and it gets very hot indeed. It has a bit like a screwdriver and I don't like it at all. The tip is held in with a screw and this has worked loose already. I forget what I paid for it, it was round about £18. I just needed to buy a collection of soldering irons mainly to make this short video series. In the first episode I showed the soldering process using quite fine electrical wire as an example. If you're soldering larger pieces of metal together, the parts may be brass, copper or even lead. If you're making a stained glass window, you do need quite a substantial soldering iron. What I'm about to solder with this 40 watt soldering iron are these three pieces of brass, two pieces of tube and a 90 degree elbow from PM Research. The procedure is very similar to any other kind of soldering. First of all, you tin the bit. That gives you conductivity of the heat from the tip through to the work. But it still takes quite a while for the work to reach the right temperature. I touched the bit onto the metal parts and applied quite a lot of multicore solder, which set hard immediately. Eventually, when the part got hot enough, the solder started to run, but it did actually run all over the place. Please be aware that I am far from stupid. Many years ago, myself and a friend both took an identical IQ test. My result came out at 138, which I thought was possibly okay. Although thinking about it now, I probably have got dimmer over the years. Once the part that I was soldering got up to temperature, the solder started to flow and didn't blob in large lumps. I finished off the job using a wet paintbrush just to tidy up the joint. This was quite a cheap soldering iron, and looking at the colour of it, I really don't think it's going to last all that long. But who knows, maybe I'm wrong, it may outlive me. I really don't like to use soldering irons of this wattage that are on all the time, because they're extremely hot. I would normally, for larger jobs, use this soldering iron. It is a weller. This is the basic model of a very well-known type of soldering iron. I had a Weller soldering iron very similar to this for many years and I don't know what happened to that, it didn't break. I think it got lost in a house move that I had in 1994. About five years ago I bought this one and it's perfectly fine, it doesn't have a light at the front like the other one. I mentioned in the last episode that I did a lot of work on Hammond organs and on a Hammond tone wheel organ there are a lot of tag strips to solder and unsolder. And this type of iron is ideal for the job, because when you're not using it, it switches off. You press a trigger switch on the front, and the bit gets hot. You release the trigger, and the bit cools down. I'm about to use this soldering iron for a job on my small traction engine's canopy. On one of the barley twist canopy supports, or olivers as they're generally called, as in Oliver Twist, I presume, the bottom part, with the ball and the thread, which holds the canopy in place on the traction engine, broke off. And as I mentioned in the episode from the series Repairing My Small Showman's Engine, I think this was possibly done by accident when my cleaner was dusting the engine which sat on the sideboard. It looks to me like the solder had actually gone what's called dry. Dry joints are common in soldering, particularly on circuit boards. 
Many times in the past I've resoldered components onto circuit boards because of dry joints and then the part works. What I've done here is put the part back together and here's the Welly Universal soldering iron gun. When I press and hold the trigger which switches the iron on, the tip starts to get hot. Very quickly as the current is flowing through it all the time. Once the tip had reached the correct temperature, the first thing to do was to wipe off the old solder that was present on it before I pressed the button. For this job, I'm currently using electrical solder. This is resin cord solder with cores of resin in the centre of the actual solder itself. There are quite a few different types of soft solders and fluxes. Baker's fluid is a liquid flux and that used to be very popular. I used to use a flux most of the time called Fluxite that did a really good job. But for convenience, the resin cord solder really is useful. But please be aware that fluxes generally can be corrosive. This resin cord solder is really useful for soldering wires, but it's also good for jobs like this. It's worth remembering though that once you've finished the soldering job, clean off the flux. Some fluxes are more corrosive than others, but either way, you do need to clean off the flux. Quality commercial printed circuit boards are normally cleaned after being soldered, and they're not soldered by hand like this, they use like a bath soldering method. This piece of metal is a little bit too thick, even for the Weller soldering iron, it's taking a long time to get the metal up to the right temperature where the solder will flow. I'm going to give it a helping hand with this really cheap and nasty blowtorch. Oh, and by the way, I did not buy this blowtorch, it was given to me by a friend. Occasionally, it just bursts into flames, which is not very useful. The blowtorch that I would normally use for this job is a Proxon blowtorch, but that's up in the other workshop. Once I'd heated up the metal to a sufficient temperature, suddenly it became much easier to work and the Weller soldering iron was melting the solder and it was running around the joint. Here I'm cleaning off the residue using a toothbrush. This keeps the area of the joint clean and here I'm applying a little bit more of this resin cord solder. A word about solder, it is getting increasingly difficult to buy lead solder. Call me old fashioned, but I do not like the lead free stuff. I don't find it makes quite as good a joint as I would expect. Here is the pipe that I soft soldered a while ago. I would never soft solder a part like this. I would just screw the threaded pipe all the way into the elbow and use some Loctite 542. Time to put the Weller soldering iron back in its box and back in the cupboard where I keep it safe. I would say, as a casual observation, Antex and Weller soldering irons seem to be the best ones out there. I think I mentioned in the previous episode that I did have a Far Eastern soldering station, and that was really poor. It went in the bin. Whatever you're soldering, whether it be soft soldering or silver soldering, the parts that you solder must be scrupulously clean. Here I'm giving you an example of that. I'm cleaning up this boiler using some Scotch-Brite. I'm not actually going to solder anything to it, I'm just showing the principle. If I wanted to solder a copper pipe, or in this case a brass pipe, I would never dream of using soft solder. I would silver solder the part. The problem is though, this boiler has been internally soft soldered. And once something's been soft soldered, you can't silver solder it because the temperature that you have to raise the metal to for silver soldering will cause problems with the soft solder and make it eat into the parent metal. To be honest, soft soldering has limited applications on the things that I work with. But it will be useful for soldering the 40 LEDs into my small traction engine's canopy. That's it for this one. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.